and welcome to the SheClicks webinar about taking control of Flash. I'm Angela Nicholson, I'm the founder of SheClicks and I'm a co-founder of Camera Jabber. First, a word from our sponsor. This webinar is sponsored by MPB, the most secure way to free up funds from your camera gear. Get free online quote, get contact free pickup from your doorstep and get paid directly into your bank account. Everything's fully insured and free of charge. Turn your camera into cash, upgrade your kit and even start a new career. So thank you very much to MPB. Today's webinar is presented by Judy Hancock Holland, who is an award winning Canadian photographic artist and a lifelong educator. It's Judy's second webinar with She Clicks. This time she's talking about Flash, but last time she was talking about uh, Lightroom and how to organize your files and folders. So, hello, Judy. Welcome back. Thank you, Angela. It's lovely to be back. You're looking very well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, I guess I'll just uh, start sharing my screen. I want to start off by just saying that I am not an expert on Flash. Until about six years ago, I was too intimidated to even try it. And then I got into Flash, and now I'm really enjoying it to simulate window light for portraits and groups, um, even flowers and still life. But I am somebody who is pretty good at helping others learn the basics and making those basics understandable. And that's what we're going to be doing today. We're not going to go into advanced techniques, but we're going to try to give you a good solid foundation and take away that in intimidation factor so that you feel that you can jump in and try some things. Um, there are lots of YouTube videos on Flash. Uh, many of them are quite advanced. Most of them are about portraits and we're gonna talk about more than just portraits today. I wanna invite you to feel free to take some screenshots of any of the slides that have text or setups on them because I, I don't want you to have to be scribbling madly uh, while, you're, while you're listening. If you're on a Macintosh, um, Command 3 will give you a screenshot and I'm not sure how to do it on PC, but uh, you have my permission to do that. So why even bother with Flash? Well, there are a number of advantages to Flash and the most important one to me is that I can really be creative in the use of light. I have more control over light. Um, it's a powerful way to add light and keep your ISO down low. So I usually use my uh, built-in camera's uh, lowest ISO or, or optimum ISO and add light and don't ever have to move that ISO higher. It's small and portable. Um, if you buy an off-brand, it's quite inexpensive. I'll talk more about gear later on. It's lightweight, it's color balance, so you don't have to worry about white balance. It's adjustable, and we're gonna talk about that later on as well, modifiable and really not that hard to learn if you've got somebody who can walk you through the steps and help you understand the concepts. Um, I'm often asked about what, what about LED lights, constant lights, and they have their place and they're really good for learning about light and how light behaves, but flash gives you much more light. It's much brighter than LED lights. And I think there's more versatility for modifying it as well. One caveat is you should never use flash when you're shooting babies. And it's questionable whether you should use it for birds and wildlife. I, I don't shoot birds and wildlife, so I'm not an expert in that area, but I have read that there can be concerns about that. So we're gonna talk about um, what you need and how to use it. So let's start off by having a look at some images taken by, with flash. Now this is probably the most basic use of flash. This was a simple um, on-camera flash outdoors and the flash was only used to put a catch light in her eyes. So it was a very low powered flash set on automatic or TTL, which stands for through the lens. Um, it just a kiss of that on camera flash gives the catch light. Simple, simple, anybody could do this. Now, a lot of people don't like flash because they think it gives really ugly light. And certainly in some situations it can. So here's a really ugly flash picture. We've got terrible shadows. Um, this was shot with TTL or that automatic flash setting. And this came out quite underexposed uh, because TTL gets fooled. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute as well. By contrast, here is the shot of the same subject that was shot with um, a, ma a manual flash setting with the flash going through a shoot through umbrella and, an, and a reflector on the other side. And then I put a texture on it in post. And this really looks like window light. 
The only reason I know this was shot with flash is because I remember shooting it that way. Um, otherwise, it could be easily mistaken for, um, for natural light, which is what I was aiming at when I learned flash in the first place. This was shot with a tripod, but even without a tripod, I seem to get better sharpness when I shoot with flash. And I think that has to do with the duration of the flash. It's a very, very quick flash, about 10 thousandth to a 20 thousandth of a second. This is known as revenge flash. Um, that's Scott Kelby's term for it. Um, terrible, terrible look. I had the camera in a vertical orientation. So my pop-up flash was a little bit to the left instead of right on top of the lens. And it would have looked even worse if I'd had the, the flash on top of the lens. But it's, it's a terrible way to use flash. If you're in a situation where you need to grab a snapshot with flash and all you have is your pop-up, try carrying a little diffuser that you can make at home in your camera bag and have that handy. You just take a milk jug, you cut the, the uh, handle off, you slit it lengthwise, and then you just slide that over your flash. Now it's not gonna work miracles, but it will be somewhat better than a bare flash. To get really good results with flash though, you wanna get the the flash off the camera. A lot of professional cameras don't even have a flash anymore. So here is what you can get when you've got full studio setup. This was two modified studio strobes. Now you can spend tens of thousands of dollars on lighting gear, but most of us are never gonna do that. I certainly won't. Um, I most often use just one off camera flash with an umbrella and a reflector. And all the images you're gonna see but one today from here on are done with one flash. So let's talk about TTL a little bit. You know when you're shooting with your camera without flash, set flash aside for a minute. If you shoot with your camera and you put it on fully automatic, it will work really well for some things, particularly things where there's moderate brightness in your scene or your subject. But if you try to shoot a black cat in a coal mine or a white dog on a sandy beach, the camera won't get it right because the camera is trying to make everything look 50% gray or average out to 50% gray. And so your camera isn't going to do well with those situations. And if you're using auto, then you need to use uh, compensation. The same is true with flash. It's basically setting your flash on auto and it talks to the camera. And if you've got a moderate scene, it'll work fine. But if I have my, my flash on TTL or auto, my bright subjects are always going to be underexposed because the, the camera and flash are gonna look at the bright scene and they're gonna say, oh my goodness, it's too bright. I need to dial a light down and it'll dial the light down and give you an underexposed uh, photo. Conversely, if you've got your flash on TTL and you're shooting a, a dark subject, then your camera and flash are gonna to talk to each other and they're gonna say, oh my goodness, there's not nearly enough light here. I need to boost up the light. And then your dark subjects will be overexposed. So I recommend very strongly that you shoot with manual flash. And that sounds scary, but it's really not. We're gonna go through it in detail today so that you get the basics and you understand the concepts. I almost never shoot manual on my camera. There are a lot of people who do. There are certain situations where I do, and flash is one of them. So if you have to have your uh, camera and, you, and, and your flash sort of on it, um, you wanna try to get your flash away from the lens. This was shot at an event, and I had to move around and shoot people who were moving around. Um, so I used a flash bracket to get my my flash a little bit away from the lens. And then I used a rogue flash bender, which I'll show you later, uh, which is basically a, a device to modify the flash and make the light softer. Um, you could also bounce your flash off of a white wall or a ceiling, walls tend to work better, but you can see here that the wall is green. And if I had used my flash bouncing it off that green wall, then the light on people's faces would have been green, which isn't exactly what I want. So often when we're faced with low light situations, we think about opening the aperture more or boosting the ISO, but adding light is another way to do that. And flash is a real godsend in that situation. So here is the very basic thing that I use when I'm shooting an event where I have to do what they call run and gun. You're moving around and taking shots. 
a very inexpensive flash bracket to get the, the flash up above your camera. And often those arms will swing off to the side so I can get my flash not only up a bit, but also off to the left a bit. And then you need some way for the camera and the flash to communicate. And uh, the old fashioned way that I learned in the film days was to use a sync cord and you can still do that in on lots of cameras. But I now choose to use a radio transmitter. You can also uh, trigger a flash with your pop up flash. But when I worked with that, it just seemed cumbersome and it is limited by line of sight. So a radio transmitter is is more useful for me. When you get your, your flash off your camera, then you start to be able to get some really nice light. This was lit with a flash on a light stand with an umbrella over to the left and a reflector on the right held by my voice activated light stand, also known as my husband. I almost always use one flash, but I do carry two or three and extra batteries just in case I have a failure along the way. This is the only shot I'm gonna show you that is um, shot with more than one flash. This was done with two flashes with umbrellas. I had one flash on each side of the camera up high with the umbrella pointed down at the group because I wanted even lighting of all their faces. Um, I did shoot on a tripod here, but I really didn't have to. The only reason I used a tripod and a remote uh, trigger release or shutter release was so that I could stand away from the camera and talk with these guys and engage with them and get their positions right. The hard part of a shot like this isn't the flash. It only took me two test shots to get, to get the exposure right. And I did that with just my husband standing in front of it to get the lighting. Um, the harder part is to get a group like this where everybody has their eyes open and the faces are all visible. But I don't do a lot of this kind of work. Um, most of what I do is more fine art kinds of work, and I really enjoy using flash there too. So this uh, hand portrait is part of a series of images that um, actually some of them are going to be exhibited in Barcelona in May. And um, I like using flash for these. So I had my flash with a thing called a light scoop, which you can see in the picture there on the left, and a reflector close into his hands on the right hand side. And I did not use a tripod here because I wanted to be able to move around and get different angles on his hands. The beauty of off camera flash is as long as the subject doesn't move and the light doesn't move, the photographer and camera can move anywhere and the light will still be right. So I find that really advantageous. Here's another example of one of those uh, hand portraits in the series that was shot with the light scoop and the reflector, very lightweight, easy to move around uh, gear. Here's what happens if you don't get your, your reflector quite close enough to soften the shadows. And in some situations, you might want this harder, harder shadow. But here we've got the diffused light on the left. Uh, I think this was also done with the flash bender. And then a, re a reflector held somewhat off to the right, not as close as maybe I might do again. I'll show you this slide because it's got a mistake in it. I didn't know what was wrong with it when I first looked at it. I just knew it wasn't right. And then I had a professional portfolio review and learned what was wrong with it. So where I really want the viewer to look here is at the hand and the bow where it meets the strings. That's, that's the area I want you to look at. And therefore, because sharpness and light or brightness draw the eye in a photograph, I should have had the, the uh, bright, brightest part of the picture as well as the sharpest be in that area. But instead, the brightest part of the light is on the forearm. Um, so now if I were doing this again, I would move the flash from the left over to the right and aim it straight at her hand. Um, I was able to fix this up in post, so it looks pretty good, but we always want to get it right in camera. It's another one where I had diffused flash with a reflector, the flash on the left, camera left, and the, um, the uh, reflector on the right. So you can get some pretty nice effects. Um, Off-camera flash is great for portraits. Uh, this was diffused. I used in the first image, I used an umbrella and uh, had it placed off the camera left. And on the one on the right, I had a rogue flash bender with a diffusion panel on it. And I placed um, in both cases, the flash was off to the camera left. Now, 
bear flash can be used for drama. You can use it in portraits for drama. You'll often see men shot this way to create a, a sense of grittiness and drama. I will sometimes use it for flowers like here. So on the left image, I used bare flash. And on the right image, I used a flash with a, a small gridded strip box. Actually, the rogue flash finder can turn into that. And you'll see a picture of that later to soften and direct the light. Um, if I wanted to do this effect with a strip box for a portrait, I'd have to have a much bigger strip box because the um, light varies in hardness with the relative size in relation to the subject. And I'm gonna, if you didn't get that, I'm gonna say it again later in a different way. I think you'll pick it up there. This is shot with a diffused flash from below and they call this horror lighting. Um, if you want a really spooky Halloween kind of portrait, then you might put your flash down below the person and shoot up at, uh, have the light going up at them. But in most cases, you're not going to want your flash to be low like that. And I like to do some special effects with flash. Um, here I shot the smoke backlit with a flash, and then I overlaid a calla lily image and blended it together in a layers program. So more and more, when I'm asked what I like to shoot, the answer is light and shadow and curves and forms. And so flash is really indispensable for that. And here's an example that is not mine, but I, I wanna share it. It's a photographer I know named Brad Powell. Um, he has learned a lot about flash. This is a technique called stroboscopic flash. And this is the kind of result you can get when you master the basics and then move on a little bit. This works by setting up the flash to put out a number of quick flashes in this case, it was five, and you can tell because there's five images of the gal uh, while using a really slow shutter speed. So he was in a dark room. He had uh, two flashes up very high, pointed down at the stage at the, where the dancer was going to be, but a dark room, and then had the flash go off five times while the shutter was open. So lots of creative possibilities open up when you learn about flash, but we're not gonna go that complicated today. Let's start by, um, talking a little bit about gear. And, you know, um, I'm a firm believer that it's the photographer who makes the image, not the gear. But uh, we'll get to the how of flash in a minute. But if you're like a lot of photographers and like me, every once in a while you get an attack of gas or gear acquisition syndrome. And we're really itching to go out and buy some new gear. And I would suggest that when that hits you again, look at lighting gear. It's much more expensive or much less expensive than um, cameras and lenses, but it will really empower you to do some cool things. So we're gonna look, start by looking here at a concept. So this will help you choose your lighting gear and your modifiers. Light looks different depending on whether the light source is small compared to the subject or big compared to the subject. So here we have a small source of light, the little, little yellow circle, and we have a basketball. And when this small source of light hits the basketball, it lights up a small part of the basketball, okay? Now, if we use a much bigger light source and we fire that light source at the basketball, it covers the entire thing. And the term that made this understandable for me was that the light wraps around the subject. If it's bigger than the subject, significantly bigger, then the light actually gets to wrap around and that makes it softer. If you're shooting macro, you don't need a very big light source because your subject is so tiny. So you could use just a bare flash with a ladybug and you would get um, the, the light wrapping around the ladybug. I have sometimes used a small light source, um, like getting a utility lamp and putting a shower cap over it, a clear or a, a white shower cap. And, and that does for small, subjects because it's significantly bigger than the subject. For a portrait, that wouldn't work because the relative size is what matters. The subject would be bigger. If people who shoot cars with, with flash or strobes, um, they have like 30 foot soft boxes because the, to get soft light, the light source has to be much bigger than the subject and a car is a pretty big subject. So a, a tenet to remember is the bigger the light source, in relation to the subject, the softer the light. <clears throat> a 
here, um, these are, this is the gear that I use. There are lots of choices out there for flash gear. Um, the ones I would recommend are Young Newell, which is this one that I use, Godox, uh, which is also known as Flashpoint. It's marketed under that name as well, and Nissan. Um, they're good, inexpensive flashes. They may be compatible with Nikon or Canon. Now, I shoot Olympus, so when I went to buy this gear, I called the, the store and said, you know, which one am I supposed to use? And they said, either one will work, but you won't have TTL. I said, great, I don't use TTL anyway, have no desire to. So it didn't matter whether I bought the Nikon one or the Canon one, but it pays to pay attention to that when you're ordering your flash gear. Um, setting these things up can be a little bit tricky, especially if you have poorly translated instructions, which I, I think was the case with the Yong Newell, but this is where YouTube is your friend. Just enter the model of your flash and you're bound to get uh, a YouTube video that shows you all the in, ins and outs of setting up your particular flash. A caution is do not use an old flash from the film days on a digital camera because um, it can fry the electronics in your digital camera. It's fine to use them off camera and trigger them some other way, but don't put them in your hot shoe. So lighting gear doesn't have to be expensive. Um, the first, the number one uh, piece of gear here is just a simple umbrella, shoot through umbrella. You can get them with a black cover for bouncing the light onto the umbrella. And actually this one came with that, but I never use that. I find that for my purposes, the shoot through works very well and it, and it doesn't cut down the light as much. Any modifier on your flash will cut down the amount of flash light that you get. Um, so that is a factor and this umbrella works really well for me. You've heard me talk about the Rogue Flash Bender. That's the one that's got the number two on it now. And here you're seeing it with the, the diffusion cover on it. And that gives quite a lovely light for small subjects. I have used it for my hand portraits quite often. And I have used it for portraits, although I much prefer the umbrella for that because the light is softer from the umbrella. Number three, there is a mini softbox that simply straps onto your flash head. And I like that for um, quite small subjects like flower blossoms. Number four, there is a disc diffuser. It's a round thing that you strap onto your um, flash head. And I'll use that occasionally, but not so much. It does have a gray card on the other side. So that can be useful for setting white balance and, uh, and exposure. And then you saw the light scoop earlier. Um, this is a Canadian made uh, device that was invented in Vancouver just across the water from me. It's good for events because it's very lightweight. The downside of it is it doesn't fold up. So that's kind of an awkward shape and I have to carry it in a cardboard box so I don't ruin it. And then uh, number six is the commercial version of a bounce card. A lot of flashes have a bounce card built in that you just pull out, but it's very small. Some uh, photographers will use a business card or an index card. Uh, held onto the flash with a, an elastic band, but uh, this is available too. I use the umbrella most of all, and probably second would be the Rogue Flash Bender, and third would be the softbox, the mini softbox. Here you also see my reflectors, which I do have commercial reflectors, but I often will use a piece of foam core. So here's the umbrella. You can see how inexpensive it is. This is an American dollar's price. And that's uh, probably your most indispensable piece. If you're looking for uh, doing portraits, I would get a fairly large one. If you're looking at doing more macro or flowers and things like that, then you can get away with using a smaller one. These are the light stands that I use. Um, again, very inexpensive. This price of $36 Canadian is for two light stands. So that's a really good deal under Amazon Basics. These ones don't come with an umbrella mount, so you do need to or order that separately. And these umbrella mounts, again, two for $21 Canadian. So again, really um, inexpensive gear and quite indispensable. Um, a lot of you probably already have one of these five-in-one um, reflectors. I have one and sometimes I'll use that, other times I'll just use foam core. The advantage of these is they fold down once you learn how to fold them down, it's uh, quite versatile and easy to carry around. But you can also make your own reflector by crumpling up some foil 
tin foil and then uncrumpling it, putting it, uh, taping it to a piece of cardboard, or you can put white on a cardboard. You could use a mirror, you could use a white wall, or if you're outside, even the side of a truck to bounce your, your flash off of. Even a white shirt or a sheet. If you've got, if you're at a wedding and you're shooting a picture, have somebody with a white shirt stand there and you can use that to uh, reflect light. This is the rogue flash bender, which is kind of an odd looking thing, but um, you can use it bare, like on the left. You can use it with the diffusion panel and you can use it as a, a mini strip box with the grid on it as I, as I, and I'll show you a shot that's taken that way. Um, these come in small, medium, large, and extra large. I have the extra large one, and I believe that's what's shown in this photograph. It can be a little bit unwieldy when you're using it on a flash bracket, but if you're using it on a light stand, it works just fine. You can move on to a lot of different modifiers. You can use soft boxes, beauty dishes, ring lights, strip boxes, but they can be pricey and they take up space. So my recommended starting kit is a flash, a transmitter or cord, an umbrella, a stand, a light stand, a reflector. And I always suggest that we use these Eneloop Pro black batteries. Eneloop Pro comes in white or black, but these are really the best batteries I know of for using flash because they tend to have lots of power and hold their charge and they're rechargeable. So on to how do you use flash? And it's really not so difficult. So I'm gonna start with a concept. And once you understand this concept, I think you'll understand flash much better. So I want you to think about flash as a bucket of light. So just hold that image in your mind that your flash is basically a bucket of light. Now, if I have a bucket of black paint and I have a fence here with a hole in it, and I ask you to go around behind the fence and stand right at the fence on the other side. And then I take my bucket of black paint and I throw it at the fence. What happens? Well, of course, you're going to get some black paint on you, right? Now, if I enlarge the hole and ask you to stand there and I throw another bucket of black paint at you, you get a lot more black paint on you, right? So think about flash like that bucket of light. And that hole in the fence is your aperture. And when I throw my bucket of paint, if the aperture is bigger, more flash is going to hit the subject, OK? There's the difference between big and small. Now think about this. I've got this bucket of black paint. I'm going to throw it at both of these fences with you standing there. What happens to something 10 feet behind you? Nothing. Nothing happens to the background 10 feet behind you because the paint can't reach that far. The paint gets on you, the paint gets on the fence, but it can't reach that background. The same thing is true of light. The flash won't reach as far as the background in most cases, unless your background's very close to you. So think about this, the aperture makes no difference when you're shooting with flash, the aperture makes no difference to how much light hits the background. I'm gonna say that again. When you're shooting with flash, the aperture makes no difference to how much light hits the background or no significant difference. Getting the flash closer means more light hits the subject. If I move the flash closer, if I've got a bucket of water and I stand two feet away from you and throw the bucket of water at you, you're going to get wetter than if I'm standing six feet away, right? And with flash, you can also turn up the, the power or you can raise the ISO. So, you know, if you've ever seen people at a sporting event indoors, uh, you know, here in Canada, it would be hockey games uh, or a, a rock concert or something. And they're taking pictures with their little point and shoot cameras with the little pop up flash. That flash doesn't reach the stage or the or the uh, soccer pit. Um, the flash simply can't reach that far. So here you're shooting a ring. You set your aperture at f8, and if your flash exposure, you get your flash exposure right. Now, if you open your aperture some more and you go to f2.8, you're going to find that the ring has a lot more light on it, right? And this shot will be overexposed. 
but the background won't change at all because it's just the aperture only affects the subject when you're using flash. The light on the background will be affected by the shutter speed. And we'll get into that in a minute. So for flash subject exposure, it's influenced by aperture and flash intensity. And flash intensity consists of both the power setting that you've set on your flash and the distance. You know, if you're outside on a dark night with a flashlight, if you hold a flashlight six inches from the palm of your hand, you're gonna get lots of intense light on the palm of your hand. But if you have a friend hold it 10 feet away and aim it at your hand, you're not gonna get nearly as much light on your hand. So moving your light source closer to the subject or farther away makes a difference to how much light is on the subject. Makes sense, right? Um, different flashes have different flash power and there's something called a guide number that indicates how powerful the flash is. It's a little bit unreliable simply because different manufacturers measure their guide numbers in different ways, but it is somewhat useful in choosing a flash. So here's a chart that may help you understand this a little bit better. So here we have apertures from f2.8, nice and wide, all the way down to f32, very narrow aperture. And we know, you probably know this already, that every um, stop, every, every gap between these two is a doubling or a halving of the amount of light. And we call this a stop. So if you move from f5.6 to f4, you're doubling the amount of light that's gonna get through the aperture, okay? You probably know that already. Flash power is similar. You can set your flash on, um, on full power and that's going to use up a lot more battery power. Or you can set it, a lot of flashes go in halves down to um, F, or down to rather one, 128 and that uses less power. And when you're using flash in some situations, it matters how long it takes your flash to charge up again. So I try to avoid shooting on full power uh, if I can possibly do that. So let's say that you have set up your flash and you've determined that you have a perfect exposure on your subject by using F8 and one eighth. And I'm going to set ISO aside here. I usually just set mine at my optimum ISO, which on my camera is 200. For many of you, it'll be 100. I just leave it there and don't touch it unless I have to. So you get your subject perfectly lit at F8 and one eighth of uh, flash power. And my, my uh, shutter speed is usually set on my sync speed, and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, if I decide that I want a little bit different effect, Let's say I want deeper depth of field, I might go down a couple of stops to F16. So I've halved the light by going to, uh, or, or halved the aperture by going to F11 and halved it again by going to 1.8. So I have to compensate for that, balance that out by changing the flash power output by two stops up. So I went two stops down on the aperture, I want to go two stops up on the flash power to keep it balanced. If I decide that I want shallower depth of field, then I might go to F4, which is two stops uh, more light on that side. So then I wanna go two stops less light on the flash output for one thirty second um, flash power. So it's just a matter of balancing aperture and flash power. Now you can also move your light closer and further away, but that also uh, has an effect on how soft or hard the light is. This might be a good place to take some questions. I'm going to talk in a minute about background exposure, but Angela, are there any questions that would fit in here? Yeah, we have a few. So let me just go back to the top. Okay. Um, oh, Pauline has asked, what size of reflector do you tend to use? Well, my foam core sheets are probably two and a half feet by maybe three feet, something like that. Uh, my round reflectors, I have two of them. One's probably about 24 inches. The other one's at 32, I believe. But it depends on what I'm shooting. I will often use just an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper if I'm shooting macro. 
Okay, that's uh, that's A4, isn't it? We we tend right. to yeah yeah right. okay. Which Olympus camera do you use? I use the uh, Olympus EM1 Mark II, and I absolutely love it. Small, light, sharp. Wouldn't trade it for any camera on the market. Okay. Uh, Joy has asked, will any ordinary white umbrella work or does it have to be special? I think you probably could get by with any ordinary one, um, but the uh, photographic ones are so inexpensive and they're made with that special diffusion uh, material. I, I would just use that. Yeah. Um, and I guess um, sometimes the just like a, a, a rain umbrella, sometimes it's thicker at the top where the right. spokes are and there's a pointy bit. So you might find that causes issues, which also actually someone has asked, oh, Steph has asked, if you use an umbrella, do you find that the spokes give a star shape on light areas? No, um, but what I will see in, uh, if I'm doing portraits, um, I'll see the umbrella shape in the person's eye, but actually that's a fairly pleasing catch light. So not a problem. Uh, Catherine has asked, what size of umbrella would you recommend for portraits? I would say at least a 36. If you've got space for a bigger one, you could even go bigger. That's assuming that you want nice soft light. Yeah. And you tend to go for shoot through rather than reflector types. Yes, I do that most often because I find that the reflector types cut down the light output more. Okay. Um, and oh, Catherine has said, I think you said something about, you know, moving the, the light forward and back to control. It says, but surely as you get closer, you're going to get harder light. It's actually the opposite. And that seems counterintuitive to me too. When I first heard that, I thought, what, that can't be right. But it actually mm -hmm. is. And think about it. When I showed you the basketball, if you get the light closer, then it's bigger in relation and it wraps around more. So the the bigger and closer the light, the softer it is. And the smaller and more distant the light, the harder it is. And that's, that's a little weird to wrap your mind around, but play with it, try it. You'll find out that it's correct. And try it with a flashlight or something, like a, try it with a constant light. It's easier to see that way. Um, Heather has asked if there's a difference between flash and constant light sources like a rotor light for tabletop work, for example. So she's thinking a bit smaller. Uh, yes, there is, but I sometimes do use a constant light for tabletop work because um, my shutter speed doesn't matter there. I can leave my shutter open for five or 10 seconds when I'm shooting a flower. Uh, and in that situation, I could also use window light. But as I say, I find because of the flash duration being so quick that I will often get sharper pictures with flash than I would get otherwise. And you could test that out. Yeah. Now, Inga's asking a question that's kind of connected with that, actually, what you just said is, is, is flash power like exposure time? Is flash power like exposure time? In the sense that flash power, power is really quick, but there's not a huge variation. Like if you have your flash on um, one eighth power, it might give you uh, a ten thousandth of a second, and if you had it full, it might give you a twenty thousandth of a second, but it's really not significant. Mm. It's only if you were photographing something that was moving really fast or split second that you'd start to to notice. I think. Well, you saw that you saw the one I showed you of the stroboscopic uh, flash with the dancer moving. Okay, mm -hmm. the dancer was leaping, and yet the flash went off quickly enough that it got five shots of her leaping. So it's kind of it's it's a bit like shutter speed or exposure in a way because you just get that burst of light and it will freeze things, but it's um, you can have the the shutter open for longer than the than the flash is firing. And we're going to move on to to shutter speed in a minute here, and I I hope it'll become clearer. And you know you might have to watch this webinar again when Angela puts it up on on YouTube because it can take a couple of run throughs to get this, but if you if you if you take some screenshots and review it and then go and play, I think you'll get it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Katarina's asked a question which relates to something very specific in your um, presentation. So um, 
you know, sometimes people ask a question just as you say something and it can be hard for the presenter to know what the specific question is, but I'll read it and it might trigger something with you or perhaps Katerina can come back. So she says, is this like when you use plus or minus exposure? So she's thinking about exposure compensation. Does that? Yeah, I, yeah. I, think, I think it is. And there is such a thing as flash compensation um, if you're using TTL, but I find that actually more complicated than using manual. Once you understand manual, it's, it's predictable, it's reliable, you're going to get the same results each time where TTL gets fooled when you change the subject. Manual, you can put any subject in front of that light. Once you've got it, uh, the exposure dialed in, you could pull out a white cat, put in a black dog in the same spot, and the exposure would be right, whereas with TTL it won't be. Uh, Sabina said, for portrait photography, would you recommend an umbrella or a softbox? If you've got a softbox, that, that's great. Um, octagonal softboxes tend to make nicer catch lights than the, than the square ones. Um, I live in a relatively small home and I don't have room for softboxes. So the umbrella ha has the advantage of folding up and, and it's easy to put away in store. But softboxes are great. Uh, Sally has said, if she's shooting uh, jewellery, what... Would, what recommended aperture and flash strength and how far away would the flash need to be? Jewelry is tricky. To that kind of thing. Um, anything shiny is tricky and jewelry is one of the more difficult things to, to shoot. And there are YouTube videos out there on how to shoot jewelry. It usually will involve um, using some reflectors and also some flags, some pieces of black foam core or, or whatever to, to block the light. That's a little more advanced than we're gonna get today. And bear in mind, it does depend, you know, if you're shooting jewellery, it depends what focal length lens you're using and how close you are, because obviously that will affect the depth of field. So you need to set up for the depth of field, the composition that you want, the depth of field that you want will dictate the aperture, and then you work the flash around it. Exactly. And very often, if I were shooting jewellery, I'd be using uh, focus bracketing and focus stacking to get the whole thing in. Like a ring is so small, you'd pretty much have to use focus bracketing for that. Um, Helen is asking if you have a sort of standard setting, one that you use most frequently, for example, say for portraits. Yes, and I'm going to get to that. Excellent. OK. Um, Ruth has said she recently bought a ring flash for her macro photography, but the settings on the screen are a mystery in spite of the instructions. I don't know whether you have any advice for her there. It's My hard to know without I knowing the flash unit. Yeah, I, my best advice is look up that particular model on YouTube and see if somebody's done a YouTube about it. A lot of these flashes are manufactured in countries that don't speak English as their main language, and the translation can leave something to be desired. But that doesn't mean they're not good flashes. I, I find I've been very satisfied with my Yongnu. In fact, I have an Olympus flash that cost as much as my three Yongnuos and the transmitter put together, and I never use it. I use the young nuos because I, I do them on manual anyway. Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a good point because a lot of the people um, producing things, they have the technical knowledge but not necessarily know how to get the translation right. And of course, the translators don't necessarily know about photography, so it can be a bit of a challenge. Exactly. Uh, um, when you bend the umbrella on a light stand to angle it towards your subject, the fabric gets caught on the light stand. Is there any way to avoid that? I'm gonna show you my setup. And um, if it's not clear after I do that, please ask your question again and I'll, I'll try to uh, answer it. Okie dokie. Um, and it said, you mentioned umbrella sizes, but was it in inches or centimeters? I was talking inches. Sorry, we changed to metric in Canada when I was in junior high and I still revert to inches and feet. <laughs> That's funny because we, we tend to use miles, but everything else we tend to do in centimeters. And That is interesting because here we use kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> Just to keep everyone on their toes. Exactly. Um, Laura has, sorry, Laura has asked, she says that she photographs weddings and loathes having to use flash. What would you use with your... Sorry, what would you use your flash in this situation? Well, for those run and gun situations, like a, a wedding reception or a dance, I probably use the rogue flash fender on a, on a flash bracket. Uh, some weddings you're able to set up various flashes around the room and, and have them bouncing and stuff, and that might work. But 
I'm not a wedding photographer. I, I do the odd event. And that's where I find that the extra large flash, flash bender on a flash bracket tends to work quite well, but it is a little cumbersome to handle. That's quite a tongue twister, a flash bender on a flash bracket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Catherine has come back and said, thank you. Well, thank you. So obviously you've helped her there. So thanks very much for that. And uh, the last question for now is um, the aperture flash power screen in the presentation. Can you just explain what the effect uh, the f4 to f sorry f the f4 to 1 to 32 does again please okay sure so our initial exposure we were at f8 and we by taking a couple of test shots we found that 1 8 power was perfect we got the perfect exposure if we decide to open our aperture up wider to let uh to get shallower depth of field and get more it gets more light in so then we have to cut down the power to balance the fact that that the aperture is letting more of it in so it's like a seesaw we have to balance the aperture if once we've got one exposure that's right then we just move aperture up a, a stop and power down a stop or the other way around if anyone is sort of struggling to remember the relationship between aperture and exposure and shutter speed and all this sort of thing, or indeed the basics of um, exposure. We've actually got a series of webinars um, with the first one was about, it's called the basics of photography. The first one was about exposure itself. The second one was about aperture. And the third one, which is next Wednesday will be about shutter speed. So those, those would be good refreshers for anyone who's just sort of thinking um, that they're not particularly comfortable with what moving through the shutter speeds or the apertures mean. Yeah, exactly. And yet it's a little bit different with flash. So I'm kind of assuming that most of you know most of that ap of that aperture shutter speed relationship, but it works differently with flash. So are we ready to go on? Yes, I think so. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the background exposure. But until now, we've been talking about the exposure of the subject. And with flash, because the flash doesn't reach to the background, it's a different picture than when you're shooting just in natural light. So shutter speed influences the amount of ambient light, light in the room or outdoors, that gets to the sensor. So if I leave my, my shutter open for um, 30 seconds, it's going to gather a lot more light from the room than if I have it open for one second or a 200th of a second. So the background lighting is going to um, be affected by my shutter speed. But my shutter speed isn't going to affect my flash exposure on the subject um, because that flash is only going off for maybe a 200th of a second or a 20,000th of a second rather. Now cameras have a maximum flash sync speed. If you go to your camera manual and you look up flash sync speed, you'll find uh, what that is for your camera. For my camera, it's 1 250th of a second. For most cameras, it's one two hundredth of a second. And that is the fastest shutter speed you can use with flash, unless you go to something called high speed sync, which we're not going to get into today because it's more complicated. Um, so I normally start, and here's partial answer to that question. My standard setting is I set my flash on one, one two hundredth or one two fiftieth of a second, and I set my ISO on my recommended ISO for my camera, which in my case is 200. In your case, it's likely 100 unless you're shooting Olympus. You can use more, uh, a longer shutter speed if you wanna get more light on the background because it takes time to get enough light on the background to make a difference. But it doesn't take time for the flash because the flash is so quick. So for flash um, on my subject, you set your aperture, your ISO and your flash power. For light on the background, you adjust your shutter speed or add a second light if you need to. This is going to take some practicing for you to get this, but um, this is a good slide for you to take a, a screenshot of. If I want more or less exposure of my background, if I want my background darker or lighter, then I adjust the shutter speed to get that. I don't do anything with the flash for that. So here's the screen that I think is going to be most useful to you. For basic manual flash, I set my camera on manual. And I think you heard me say earlier, I, I rarely shoot on manual otherwise, once in a while, but not that often. I set my camera on manual mode for flash. 
I set my shutter speed at the sync speed for my camera, which you get from your manual. I set my desired ISO, which is my standard um, default ISO for my camera. In my case, it's 200. In yours, it may likely be 100. And then I set my desired aperture, depending on um, what depth of field I want. So I've got those all set. And then I add flash to taste, and I take a couple of test shots to see how much power I need from my flash to get the exposure right, given these things. If I get to the point where my flash is giving its maximum output and I still don't have enough light, then I can move the flash closer to the subject or then I might open my aperture some more um, if it won't adversely affect my depth of field or I might raise my ISO. But my priority would be to try to keep my ISO low. So yes, and if I want more light on the background, I slow my shutter speed down. Um, if I want less light on my background, um, I might have to move the background further away. And you'll see uh, some setups here in a minute. So here's a diagram showing um, what you can do if you can't get your flash off your camera. You have a flash, but you don't have a light stand um, and you don't have an umbrella. You've just got a flash that normally you use on the, on the hot shoe of your camera you can bounce that flash off a reflector or a white wall, basically anything that's white. Um, and you have to remember that the angle that the light hits the reflector at is the same angle it's gonna bounce off at. If you remember uh, mathematics in school and geometry, it was the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And we have a slide on that. So if my flash is aimed at my reflector, my wall, my ceiling, whatever, at that angle, it's going to bounce off at the same angle. If I change the angle my flash is shooting at, it will change the angle that it's reflected at. And it's always going to be the same. If I shoot my flash this way, then it's gonna bounce off at that same angle. So it's a bit like playing pool. If you've ever played pool and you, and you take a tricky shot where you put the cue ball into the side of the pool table and you want it to bounce off, this same thing applies. So I often think about um, playing pool from in my misspent youth um, when, I, when I am using flash. So here's a setup. Um, often behind the scenes shots are not beautiful, uh, this, especially at my house. I tend to be a little disorganized housekeeper, but I never let my housework interfere with my art. Uh, so here, this was a setup. I was trying to simulate the window light. Uh, that particular window is in a very shaded area, it gets very little light. So I pulled the blind down because it's white and I bounced the flash off the window to soften it to get this uh, picture of these calla lilies. My black background there is just a trifold display like kids use for science fairs. I bought it at uh, Staples. You can get them at Office Depot. I don't know what your equivalents are in Britain. And I've I've set it up so that the two wings of it are facing forward to block light coming from my light source. And I've got my background some distance behind my subject so that the light fall off um, will keep the background dark. In other words, I'm, I'm blocking light. The light from the flash isn't going to go as far as the backdrop. Sometimes I'll even put a piece of black foam core across the top of that and you see there's a piece of black velvet hanging on the edge of that uh, display. And I will sometimes clamp that to the background because velvet is nice and non-reflective. So here is the result that I got with that setup. Now I had left the overhead light on to reduce um, some of the shadows on the right-hand side. I could have done this with the reflector as well, uh, but I knew I was shooting for black and white. I did not want this to be a color shot. Uh, so I wasn't worried about the white balance and I just shot it. Uh, the light color from the flash could be very different from the light color from the ceiling fixture. Um, and if you were going for a color result, that would uh, be a problem. Here's a setup that I will often use when I'm shooting flowers and I do a lot of flowers. Um, I use my modified flash often with an umbrella, sometimes with a mini softbox or the Rogue Flash Bender. Uh, usually on the left hand side because our eyes tend to find light falling from the left to the right more pleasing than the other way around. 
and I could move the light source to modify how the shadows fall, and I could move the backdrop closer or farther away depending on how lit I want it, and I can move my reflector closer and farther away, and each one of those movements will make a difference to my final result. So here's a shot again where I've got the um, flash aimed through the umbrella, and I have the umbrella just just in the umbrella mount so that the flash and the umbrella are as far apart as I can get them. And this might pertain to the question earlier. The farther I can get my flash from the umbrella, the bigger the light source is actually going to be. And I wanted nice soft light. Um, keeping the flash far like that makes, makes it a bigger light source, which is softer. If I wanted less soft, I'd, put, I'd pull that umbrella in closer to the flash or change to a different, um, a different modifier like a mini softbox or something. This was shot with the, the uh, flash through the umbrella, no reflector and no overhead light. It's got some very soft shadows on it and the light wraps around the subject because the light source is so much bigger than the subject and it's diffused. Here's my typical setup for black backgrounds. Um, again, the trifold display with the wings forward. I've got a piece of foam core there held on a light stand as a reflector. I've got my rogue flash bender off to the left. And in this case, um, you'll see that the, the, the flash is directly to the side. Very often I'll shoot at a 45 degree angle, but I wanted a very specific result. And I'll show you what I ended up with. I wanted the textures highlighted and I wanted some, some shadows. So I uh, took the shot and this is what I got. Again, I knew I wanted black and white. So you see the color shot on the left. And um, I exposed to the right. I exposed for the highlights and let the shadows fall into darkness. I knew I wanted a low key black and white shot of this flower. And so that's how I achieved it. Here's my high key setup. I have a, a second display board that is white and I put the wings of that behind it because I don't want to block light from the from the background and I um, have it a little bit closer to the to the flower because I want a little bit more light on it that time. The umbrella and reflector are great for people too, especially for women where you want nice soft light. The closer you get the two light sources, the flash and the, and the uh, reflector providing fill light, the closer you get both of those to your subject, the softer the light is going to be. And the larger they are, the softer the light. So here are a couple of portraits that I shot. Uh, you can see, if, perhaps you can see, the umbrella in the, uh, in the eyes, the catch light in the eyes. The umbrella and the reflector were both very close to this subject. For the black background shot, I used uh, my maximum flash sync speed. In other words, I put my shutter speed as fast as I could and still work with flash, which in my case was a 250th of a second and in yours might be a 200th. And I find this black background really sets off gray hair nicely. And I like shooting seniors. So I like to uh, use that for the, for the contrast. In the second one, I used a light background. I've applied a texture in post and a slower shutter speed. So um, I think my shutter speed on that one was a 30th of a second. You can see it's made absolutely no difference to the, the uh, exposure on the subject, but it makes a difference to how much ambient light comes in from the background. I could have added a hair light, um, which you could do just by having a second flash set at a lower power uh, off at an angle behind the subject. If you want to get fancy, you can certainly do that. Um, I haven't done that in that example. Here I have the reflector even closer to my subject and you can see that there's very little in the way of shadows. And when you're shooting people who have wrinkles or maybe younger people who have acne, then this does them a favor by reducing the shadows, you reduce the texture on the skin and make them look just a little nicer. Sometimes you can even use a, a large white wall or a large reflector behind you and aim the flash backwards and uh, reduce the shadows that emphasize wrinkles that way. Sometimes um, you could even have your flash on the camera as long as you're not standing behind the camera. If you've got your 
camera on a tripod and you're standing to the side, you could have the flash on the camera turned around backwards, aimed at a white wall and get soft light that way. And here's an example. These women are both in their late 60s. And by bouncing the flash off the wall behind me, I got this beautiful soft front lighting, which for lots of subjects you don't want, but for uh, particularly for older women, it can be very, very flattering. Now, sometimes you don't want soft light. Sometimes you want hard dramatic light. So um, here I was using a bare flash and moved it farther away from my subject. And this can work with people and all kinds of subjects. So the, the, here's another screen you might want to take a shot of. A close, large, diffused light source gives you soft light and a smaller, more distant, undiffused light source gives you hard light those harsh shadows. If you want a dark background, keep the light undiffused for this kind of lighting, um, close, closer to the subject, your light source closer to the subject and the background farther away. So none of the light reaches the background. If you want a light background, you, you reverse that. You put the light farther away perhaps and the background closer so that more light hits the, um, the background. You can get really creative with flash. This was a bare flash shot off camera. It's an old slinky toy. Um, you can also add gels to your flashes, which are colored uh, sheets of acetate or something, and you, you put them on. I didn't do that for this, but I could have. Um, I did this in post by turning the shot to black and white and then split toning with purple in both the highlights and the shadows. Flash makes it really easy to get effects like this. And if you wanted to get fancy, you could use two flashes with two different colored gels and shoot your subject that way and you would get a more of a two-tone effect. You can also, I know uh, she clicks did a, a webinar recently on light painting, I believe, and you can use flash for light painting too. You can do it in a flashlight with a flashlight in a dark room, or you can use a neutral density filter to cut down light, but you can also use flash. And I have just ordered this little device that you see on the right hand side. It's a rogue grid that attaches to my flash and will make the, the light go straight on. So I think it'll create a, a spotlight effect. But you can do the same thing with a Pringles can to some extent. Um, you take both ends of the Pringles can off, you put the flash head in one end and aim it through, um, and that becomes a snoot that concentrates the light into more of a beam. This is a rose that was light painted in a dark room and then a paint effect was added afterwards. And it's just light painting is a fun technique. You can use the flash uh, or the light from even your phone or your iPad. And, and I might refer you to the light painting uh, webinar that Angela's put up. So don't be afraid of flash. I really suggest very strongly that you use manual flash for better results, more consistency and to get to understand it better. Um, you might use TTL for events, but I often don't even do that. I would start with the inanimate objects to practice on. I practiced on a teddy bear when I was starting off and I moved the lights around the teddy bear and he was infinitely patient. I could try all kinds of different combinations of reflectors and modifiers and distances and apertures. And that's how you learn. Um, and I think you'll really enjoy the ability to control and, and direct the light. A really good um, flash education website is strobus.com, particularly the Lighting 101 course might be a, a nice addition to what I've taught you here. So I would suggest that you give this a go, see what you think, and post your results on the SheClicks Facebook page and maybe ask for feedback and advice and just keep practicing and you'll come to a point where you get it and you realize that, wow, this is easy because as long as I set it up once and I keep my subject in the same place, my light in the same place, then I can move around with my camera, I can change the subject and I don't have to worry about the lighting being wrong. So that's the presentation. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and uh, we'll see if Angela has any more questions. Yes, we do, that was great, thank you. Um... We have a couple of questions to start off with about your kit. Now, someone has asked, uh, Joanne asked if there was perhaps a list that you wouldn't mind posting somewhere with the, the list of the kit that you used. And as a sort of aside to that, Susie was saying she wasn't sure what you were saying when you were saying the rogue flash bender. She thought it might be rogue vendor. She wasn't sure what she was hearing. So Right, 
Rogue is the company that makes it and Flashbender is the device that I'm talking about. And I actually, uh, before we started, told Angela I'd be happy to put together a, a little PDF document with some of that information and maybe it could be on the, uh, maybe the files section of the SheClick site. Um, I'm also quite happy. I, I do read the SheClick's Facebook page every day um, and see most of those posts. So if you have questions there, I'm quite happy to answer them as well. Great, thank you very much. So uh, Susie, so when we say rogue flash bender, think of it because it's bending the light. So that's a good way of remembering it when you have the uh, uh, modifiers on. Okay, um, Laura has asked, what effect does distance from the subject have on your standard settings? Okay, so if you take a flashlight and you're three feet from your subject and you shine it on the, on the subject in a dark room, it's gonna have a certain amount of light. And then if you back up 10 feet, it's gonna have much less light, right? So if you move your light farther away from your subject, you're going to have to compensate by either opening the aperture some more or increasing the flash power, one or the other, because you wanna get more light onto your subject. Okay, that's uh, nice and straightforward. Uh, next question, if you're using bounce flash, now this is a really good question, if you're using bounce flash, does the distance to the wall or reflector influence the amount of light? Yes, absolutely, because you think about the, the flash, like when I'm shooting with the flash aimed backwards behind me, I have, to, I have to realize that the light is going all the way to the wall, so I'm losing some light there, then it's turning around and coming back to my subject, so I'm losing more light there. Okay, yeah, so it's it's sort of like the overall distance that you've got to think about. Right. Um, there's a question here I don't quite follow, Anila, maybe you want to expand on it. It says, do you not have, do you not have a, a trigger and a receiver, i.e. the trigger on your flash and the receiver attached to the base of your flash, or is this TTL? I don't okay, really- that, That's a good question. I understand the question, I think. Oh, that's good. Um, some flashes, yes, you have, you have a, a receiver that you attach to the flash. My flashes have the receiver built in. So oh, of my Yang Nuo that has a, actually, I think it also has a transmitter built in, but I don't use that. It's got the receiver built in and then I have the transmitter on my camera. I don't have to have add anything to the flash. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Iris is saying, what's the name of the clamp on the flower, please? Actually, a couple of people have asked that question. That's a brilliant piece of kit, and it's not awfully expensive. I think I paid about $70 Canadian for it. It's called a plamp, P-L-A-M-P. And it, one end clamps to a tabletop, and the other end holds a flower very delicately so you don't damage the flower. It's, it's a wonderful kit. And you can also attach it to your tripod leg if you're shooting outside. Is that made by Wimberley? Yes. Uh, Katerina says, what kind of aperture and lens do you use for pictures of flowers? It varies a little bit. I have a, an Olympus 60 millimeter macro lens, which is a 120 full frame equivalent focal length. And if I'm going to do really close ups, I often will use that. But the tulip that you saw that I shot for low key, I was using a 12 to 40 millimeter um, uh, zoom lens. And in both cases, I was using F16. Now, I often do focus bracketing and focus stacking when I'm getting really close. So some of the calla lilies that you saw as close ups were done with um, focus stacking. And I figured out how to make focus bracketing and flash work together. Um, but that's sort of a next step in complication. Okay, <laughs> we'll save that for another time then. Yeah. Um, Shelley has said, with the portraits of the senior females, what lens did you use for that, please? I think I was probably using my Olympus 45 millimeter 1.8 lens, and I never shoot on 1.8, um, probably 5.6 or something like that. It's a very lightweight, extremely sharp lens. Uh, but I also have used my 60, 60 millimeter macro for portraits because that's a 120 equivalent focal length, which is nice and flattering for portraits. Okay, yes. Uh, Rebecca is saying, if the flash is off camera, what triggers it to go off when you press the shutter? That's where the transmitter comes in. Your transmitter attaches to your hot shoe 
And when you press the shutter, the transmitter sends a signal to the flash and sets it off. Now, you can do that by using a pop-up flash and the, the, uh, your other flash can pick up the, the light from the pop-up. But I found that finicky because you've got to make sure that there's a clear line of sight and it's just more complicated. So I found the transmitter on, on the hot shoe and the flash off is a good combination. So that uses uh, sort of wireless connection. Yes. And so you and, don't have problems. Sometimes you can have problems outdoors, can't you, with some triggers because that it, with infrared light, it, if it's sunny, they can get lost. That's right. Okay. Uh, Catherine says her flash is also displaying an F number, for example, F5.6. Could you explain what that is, please? But probably not. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> it may be that that's a recommended uh, aperture for the particular flash power setting you have, but every flash is different. My flashes don't have that, either the Olympus or the Young Newell. So again, I would go to YouTube and enter your flash model and get somebody who really knows that flash to explain that. Okay. Uh, Judith says she has a little pullout thing on her speed light. It drops down over the flash end of the speed light. What's that for? Is it a diffuser? It doesn't cover the whole flash head. It is a diffuser, likely if it's a transparent or translucent piece. Um, a lot of flashes have two little pullout things. One drops down over the flash head and, and is for diffusion, although it's not terribly effective. And the other is a little white card that you pull out so that it is above the flash and it bounces the light to some extent. But again, these are tiny modifiers, so they don't make a whole lot of difference. And often those, um, the, the one that folds down is often to sort of spread the flash a bit further. So there's like a, a maximum zoom range that your, your flash will cover when it's on the camera. And so when you put that down, it will cover slightly wider. But as Judy right. says, then they're, they're not especially effective. And a lot of flashes do have a setting for focal length so that it will spread out the flash more if you're using a wider angle and concentrate it more. Um, I don't tend to worry about that much. I, I will sometimes match it to my focal length, but again, it's not a huge effect. If you're using modifiers, they have a much bigger effect. Now, Fiona's got a problem sometimes. She says she struggles with flash, sorry, fast shutter for quick subjects and flash syncing, recycling time lags, uh, is she doing and, and recycling time lags? So, is she doing something wrong? Well, if you're not using high speed sync, and I don't, then your maximum shutter speed should be a two hundredth or a two fiftieth of a of a second. It's the flash that stops the motion for you. So, your flash puts output at maybe a ten thousandth or a twenty thousandth of a second. So I don't know if that answers your question. If it doesn't, maybe clarify it in the Q&A. OK, yes. And also, I mean, the, the flash recycling time, um, that can be, you know, that can be uh, a limiting factor on the number of shots you can take in succession. Yes, and I did mention that the Eneloop Pro Black batteries, they tend to be better for quicker flash recycle time. Uh, if you buy ordinary like flashlight batteries, they're not going to recycle as quickly. And also the power of your flash. I mean, you can you can get flash um, units that have different levels of power and a larger power will um, probably recycle faster because you can use it on less than full power. OK, um, Esther says, could you explain what the zoom range is? Is she talking about the zoom range on the flash? I get. I think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so I that's, think I, that I question popped in that. just after we were talking about zoom and focal length. Okay. So the if I'm using a, a 24 millimeter full frame lens, I'm getting a pretty wide um, field of view. So I want my light to spread out to cover the full field of view, and so the flash might have a setting for 24 millimeter. And then if I go to a 135 millimeter lens, I don't want the light spread out that far because I'm going to be wasting light on, on an area that isn't even in my field of view. So then I would change my um, zoom setting on the flash. 
Yeah. Sometimes it will adjust automatically. Sometimes you have to push it or pull it yeah. to do it. And it's it's assuming, as said, that the, the flash is on top of the camera, because obviously if it's off to one side, it doesn't doesn't work in the same way. Um, right. Oh, Laura said, could you exp well, we've got two questions about flash curtain. Someone's saying, could you explain flash curtain? And Katarina saying what's best uh, first or second curtain? OK, we're getting into more complicated waters here. Yes. Um, and I don't I don't mess with those things. I, I started off by telling you I'm not an expert. So uh, what I can tell you is that the shutter has two curtains and they both move um, when you're opening and cl closing the shutter. If your shutter speed is faster than what your camera sync is, you will get a black band on your on your image because one of those shutter curtains got got in the way of your photograph. So that's why it's important to keep your shutter speed no faster than the sync speed specula uh, spe specified for your camera. Um, you can stop motion, for example, the one that I see sometimes is like if a dancer is moving and you want some blur ahead of the dancer or behind the dancer, that's where uh, front and rear curtain sync comes in, but I'm not the person to explain that. So I would suggest YouTube might be your friend in that case. <laughs> it's not something I mess with. I keep yeah, it simple. Fair enough. Yeah. I think basically they normally shoot at the, the advantage of sticking with first curtain shutter is that, you know, when you press the shutter release, the flash is going to go off. If you do it as second curtain, as Judy says, you can have, if you've got quite a long exposure, the flash will be at the end. So you get, um, you get the, um, the blurring going behind the person. Is that right? Yes. Um, if they're moving. But the disadvantage is you don't know how, how, at what point the flash is going to fire. So it can get a bit confusing because obviously, you know, you say if you've got a second exposure duration, you press the shutter release and then sort of almost towards the end of that, the, the flash will go off. You don't know where that person's going to be in the shot. But that's, I think, as Judy says, maybe go to YouTube and have a look at that one. Um, Sheila's just said uh, for quicker recycle time, lowering the power helps. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Well, we have, oh, no, there was one more question, sorry, that came in uh, from Facebook, which was for a group of six to seven people, what softbox would you recommend? Um, I probably wouldn't use a softbox in that situation. I would probably use maybe one flash, maybe two. It depends on how you have them, um, how they're standing. If they're in a row, like the, the men in that chorus were, then I would use two for sure. If you've, if you've situated them in different rows, front to back, then I might use one flash, but you have to realize if you do that, that more flash is going to hit the people in the front row than in the back row, and that can be a problem. Yes, so if you had one off to the side, you might be two people in, they'd be nicely exposed, but the other people will get gradually darker. And that's why I get my flash very high when I do that picture of the, of the uh, chorus, because then it's pointing down at them rather than straight at them and the fall off is going to be less. Great. OK, so uh, we've come to the end of the questions and we're getting lots of thank you very much. Um, thank you for your answers. I think people have learned a lot and thank you for your presentation. It's been really useful been enjoyable, awesome. too. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me, Angela. Bye bye.